Hola, buenos días. Bueno, muchas gracias por venir también hoy en esta segunda jornada sobre videojuegos y entornos virtuales. En este segundo día llevaremos a cabo un poco el trabajo más detallado de cada una de las cuatro mesas redondas que quedan todavía por celebrar. En primer lugar, vamos a, va a tener lugar la mesa sobre apoyo e impulso institucional al ecosistema europeo de los videojuegos. El objetivo de esta mesa es establecer un diálogo entre Estados miembros, instituciones nacionales, sobre cuáles son las principales características de las políticas de promoción y apoyo al ecosistema de videojuegos, incluyendo el régimen de subvenciones, instrumentos financieros, fiscalidad o ayudas estatales. En general, se quiere analizar eh, cuáles son todas estas políticas públicas y formular distintas propuestas de mejora. Modera Joanna Nillander, de Data Alpels Branchen, de la industria del videojuego sueco. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. I'm Johanna from the Swedish Games Industry Association. We are one of the countries in Europe without any institutional support. And I can see both pros and cons with that. Uh, I'm here with a lovely panel. And since we are many, I will kick into this discussion and starting with uh, Kresimir. Partel, did I? Thank you. Almost creation. You are the Secretary of State to the Cultural uh, Minister, right? Yes, correct. Yes. And how does video game support work in your country? Well, it all started in 2018 when we were drafting the new law on audiovisual activities. So, can everybody hear me? No. Okay, Carlos. Okay, so this one works. So it started in 2018, we were drafting the new law on audiovisual activities, and um, we had a public consultation with the law and our cluster for game developers um, entered some objections about the law and they asked for a meeting. They came to the ministry and they said, like, we're trying this for a long time to get you guys to notice us game developers, but it's not working, so we'll try Once again, we don't expect anything, and from that came a great friendship between game developers and the Ministry of Culture and Media. We introduced them in the law on audiovisual activities, and we immediately starting finance them in 2019 from our uh, program in the Ministry of Culture, promoting internship, entrepreneurship in uh, creative industries. And uh, with that said, we started drafting the bylaws in our uh, film center to finance uh, production and development because the Ministry of Culture gave uh, funds for capacity building, not for programs. In uh, 2022, we had uh, first uh, a tender for game developers that enter into the financing from audio our audiovisual center. And we actually had great results. Everybody was spectacle. The movie industry, which is primarily financed uh, through the, our film center, was skeptical. But when they saw what, with what did they applied, they were happy. Because uh, video games like Professor Balthazar, which is a famous creation, Uh, cartoon got funds, a game concerning Wuchdal culture also got funds, a game uh, uh, with a theme from uh, the book from our famous uh, child author Ivan Abelic Majoranic Regoc uh, got funds, even a game with our legendary basketball player Dejan Petrovic got funds. So there was diversity and there was culture expression. It was something good, and everybody recognized it. And the problem is, of course, getting enough funds. Because in Croatia, we have an ecosystem where we have contributors to the movie industry, like uh, operators, uh, VODs, uh, commercial television. And they all contribute 2%, 0.8%, 0.5%, 0 but it's enough to cover the, the movie industry. And we want to find a similar model for 
the gaming industry. Also, uh, we drafted the uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund, and we got uh, 34 million euros for the creative industry. We are going to put tender in about 10 days, and this is also going to be for the whole creative industry, including game developers. Also, we have a hub in uh, Novska, which is uh, financed but by EU funds, and this is working very well. Uh, we had a program, edu for games with a combination of four academies, Academy of Dramatic Art, Academy of Fine Arts, Academy uh, Faculty of Engineering, uh, Faculty of Design. We had an EU project, edu for games for future game design, and also in the city of Novska, we have a high school for technicians in the uh, video gaming industry. So we're trying to cover everything to boost the gaming industry in Croatia. One more example, in 2018, when these gamers came to the Ministry of Culture, we had 27 studios. Today we have over 65. So this is more than 100% more game. That's a good growth. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not enough, and I will speak later, what is uh, the position uh, in Croatia on boosting uh, video games. Thank you. From Croatia to another country, the country we're in, Kala Penna, you work for the Minister of Culture and Sports in Spain, right? How, does, how, does you, how, how are you supporting video games? Thank you. I know. Yes. Oh, thank you. As my general director said yesterday, um, the video game industry has been recognized as a cultural industry by the or parliament in 2009. So, as a result of that recognition, we have been supporting for a long period of time the, the industry. It has been in the latest day, uh, years when we have a more specific approach with uh, specific grant schemes and uh, instruments. And as in Croatia, we try to to do an integral and a holistic approach to the, to the video game industry and together with other ministries as the economy ministry, uh, we have um, set a, a Spain Audiovisual Hub, uh, so I invite you to, to check it in the website. The Spain Audiovisual Hub is a program of 1.6 billion euros uh, that states from uh, 2021 to 2025. We have already implemented 1.2 billion uh, of this program and it comes with a Start with a website when, when everybody can find everything about video games as a part of the audiovisual sector in that platform. So they know information, regulation, uh, any kind of support they have at any kind of level, at national level, regional level, and local level. So we will try to put everything in a box ready for, for, the, for the industry. And as instruments, we have a a uh, wide set of wide array of, of, of instruments. We have uh, eight schemes uh, for pre-production, production, and commercialization of video games. We are also trying to boost the establishment of uh, incubators and hubs. For us, it's very important to have facilitate the so-called facilitators. We are uh, we are ministries. We are big dinosaurs, uh, great dinosaurs, uh, f full of paper and bureaucracy. And we know that with the, with the, with this kind of industry, we need to communicate very well with them. We need to, we need to reach them. And these kind of incubators, like in Malaga, in Madrid, uh, and so on, they uh, provide mentoring. They provide uh, uh, the necessary information and assistance in that part. And most of our industry, are, they are mainly SMEs, requires they require uh, uh, legal assistance. They require high, now, how to apply to a grant or how to prepare for an, uh, for an investor. So it's very important to come with these kind of facilitators. We have also financial instruments. We have, we have a, a, a program of loans for the audiovisual sector, including the, the video games. And it's also, we find quite useful to have uh, financial guarantees. I think that the banking sector and the financial system is quite reluctant to, to go to the very immaterial or maybe less uh, um, material, I would say, yeah, it's not real estate uh, video games. So it's, it's, they, 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 they're not quite attractive sector for our, our financial system and we need to engage them you know, and, uh, for, for banking, uh, financial guarantees and uh, specific loans for this kind of industry will also be quite, quite useful as well. We have also scholarships uh, yeah, because we, we realize that they need more training, they need to improve their entrepreneurial uh, skills 
Um, but we have a lot of job to do. We, we realize that it's an industry that is fast growing and it requires, uh, requires a lot of needs. And we try to put it at the same level of the remaining audiovisual sector. So there's a, a lot of job to do. And I hope that these sessions and the future meetings that we have will help us to, to engage and to have the, the best practice from, from other European countries as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for organizing this event as well. Uh, from Spain to Germany, uh, Skander Morgenthaler, uh, you are working for the Games Department at the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs, right? And, and you have a Games Department. What are you doing and how does Germany support video games? Well, actually, it's uh, not a department, it's a division, but... Um, a division. It's, it's, it's still, still, <laughs> it, has, <laughs> it has games on it. <laughs> St still nice, yes. Um, I also need to add that it's not only economic affairs, but also climate action, but uh, I'm on the economic affairs part, but just to, to be just to the other part of our, of our ministry. Um, yeah, well, I was... Um, Getting into uh, games on the federal level in 2015 when I took over the responsibility for the uh, German Video Game Awards, which was back then the only activity on the federal level about games. And um, eventually we got uh, support and uh, funds for a, for a video game fund, um, which is right now at 50 million a year. Actually this year we even have 70 million because it the, the funds get stocked up because they went out last year already for this year. Um, unfortunately, now they are out again and they are out for the next year as well. <laughs> We're hoping to get more money, but um, there's a lot of demand and um, there, there's uh, quite a lot of studios and um, while well, we are somewhat generous with the money, so it's not uh, loans, but uh, on the federal level we give out grants and it's up to 50% for smaller games and 25% for larger games, and then there's, uh, it, it goes down from 50 to 25 in between. Um, yeah, we have had over 400, no, over around 500 uh, games supported by now. Well, not, not games, but uh, games and extensions and stuff like that. So it's basically it's 500 projects. And there's, in addition to the federal level, we also have uh, local funding at the state level. So Berlin is doing some funding, North Rhine-Westphalia, Bavaria, Hamburg, some, some other states as well. Um, and they've been doing that for quite a longer time than the federal level. But um, for them, uh, or with those uh, local systems, it's, um, there's a jury that elects the games. While on the federal level, we try to compete with the uh, tax break system. So we, we do a first come, first serve approach right now, or uh, up until recently when we uh, still accepted applications, and um, try to um, yeah, make it easier to, to find out if you will get money or not. So, of course, with the tax break system, you know what you get. And so we try to emulate that without having a tax break system. Um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't really work when the funds run out. <laughs> um, that's the problem we have right now. We are evaluating uh, the system right now because the, uh, the guidelines run out at the end of the year and we need new guidelines approved after that. So we are doing a big evaluation right now, uh, look at what we can do better. We are also considering um, in the future to um, have a, a system of grants next to a tax break, but we don't know if we get there yet. Um, we know that tax breaks only uh, is probably a problem for the smaller companies, uh, but the system right now doesn't really work for all of them either. At least it doesn't work as good as we hope it would work. Uh, I guess in some other countries I would agree that um, it still works reason reasonably well. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's the, the, the larger parts that we do, and we also had a strategy to um, get Germany as a games hub more in front. So um, basically, uh, the, of course, there's a funding, but we realized funding is not everything. Um, it's, it's equity money, stuff like that, workforce. Um, Germany is not really known as a developing place. Uh, I mean, if you look at the European numbers, we're not that bad, but 
if, if you ask gamers about games from Germany, most of them don't know any, um, which is partly because we lack uh, AAA games. Um, we do have a few companies generally being able to do them, but even if they try, they're not always successful. Um, so there, um, the, the other problems already mentioned, like hubs and um, education, um, there are also large problems in Germany, of course. It's a relatively new industry, so uh, a lot of infrastructure still has to fall into place, unlike other, place, uh, other industries that are there for years and years and years. Um, so there, there's still a lot to do. Um, we are slowly um, approaching the topics that we have in the, uh, the, in the game strategy, um, but uh, we are low on manpower to really do all those things. And uh, with a lot of things in Germany, even though we are responsible for games and we are the, the main point for games in, in the uh, federal government, of course, if you're getting more specific, it's always someone else who's uh, responsible. If you're talking about education, it's someone else. If you're uh, talking about the protection of youth, it's, it's someone else. Uh, until last year, it was someone else who we were talking about um, the, uh, the, the, the economic side of it because I was in the uh, digital part of the government back then. Um, so whatever you do, uh, it's, it's always trying to, to uh, get people um, to, to support you. And on the, uh, on the parliamentary level, we have successful and huge support. Everyone thinks uh, games are important. Um, but if it comes to the, in, to the uh, ministries, um, it's, it's a lot harder. Um, we are hoping we will get there uh, once the older people are gone and the, newer, <laughs> the, the younger ones who know games um, Generation. know what they're doing. But Thank you. I, I guess I, we will probably get back to some of these issues uh, later in the panel. And I think that the fact that games are slipping in between of culture and business and uh, uh, export and, and everything is, is not just on, on a governmental level, but also in, in research. I know that we are, and, and some, some of that I think we'll talk about later during this day as well. Julianne, you work for uh, the, the film institutions in Europe or the uh, European Film Agency. That's correct, right? And uh, you're not from a country, is you, or, or you are from a country, <laughs> but, but you're well. not here representing one country. You are working with all of them uh, in Europe. Uh, what, how, how does the film agencies around yes. Europe support games? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Indeed, I'm not from a specific country because I'm representing 37 film and audiovisual centers, film and audiovisual institutes across Europe, because in each, every country, you have a public institution that is supporting the audiovisual sector with public money, so that you have a diversity of creation, different languages, different stories. And you might wonder why I'm here, because we are not talking about film and series and documentaries. We are talking about video games, and I'm here because more and more EFAD members are into supporting video games. And, and this is a trend that we observe and that is increasing, and we have amazing examples around the table. The uh, Croatian Audiovisual Centers, the VAF that would, be, that would be developed. So indeed, the recognition that video games are cultural works has been done in several countries and more and more countries. There is an issue of having enough money to support yet another genre with these cultural objectives, but the recognition is there. And I want to mention the most uh, important fund at national level by the film uh, and audiovisual uh, centers. You have, of, co of course, the Sensei who has an amazing FAGV, a selective funding, cultural perspective. You have the VAF, you have the Nordic Norwegian Film Institute, the Danish Film Institute, you have a bit of Screen Ireland. I'm checking we have Croatia, of course. Um, and we will have soon, uh, also the French-speaking CCA has started to do something in Belgium. We will have soon other countries joining the group of, you know, uh, helping with selective and cultural funding. This is a case of Czech Republic who wants to introduce some loans to the creation of, of video games. Uh, and this is at national level by film and audiovisual centers. 
not talking about the six countries with tax incentives. You mentioned Germany, it's not a tax break as such, but it's close to it. But we have, of course, in France, a powerful tax incentive. You have in Greece, in Ireland, in Italy, so you have in total, and in the UK, of course, you have in total six countries with tax incentives for video games. So that's another instrument. Tax incentive, the selective cultural funding by my members, and the regional funds that are also extremely active and extremely important. So that's a bit in addition to uh, the EU fundings that were mentioned yesterday. You start to have a kind of, let's say, a variety of public funding that could support the sector in addition to the private funding. I'm sure we'll get to the main challenges of this public-private funding and also um, I would mention this concept of promoting what we call strategic cultural assets at European level because we believe that studios are, and I'm reusing a, a concept that was developed by the French presidency in the conclusion that maybe we can talk about a bit more in detail. Thank you. Happy to have you here. Last but not least, Yuri. Uh, Lutz, I, yeah. uh, you are head of one of these game funds that Julian just mentioned. Mike's, okay, the mic is working. Uh, yeah, I'm head of the game fund uh, in Flanders. That's the visual, the, the VAF we call it. It's the Flemish Audiovisual Fund. Uh, we've been doing it for 11 years now. So we started really small in 2012. Um, now we're three people and we have 2.7 million a year, which is not a lot, but we, it's also a small region. So we're like 6.5 million people in Flanders and Brussels combined. Um, and I, I would like to elaborate on the role of a cultural fund. If that's okay for you, I, I have some slides. Yes, um, Yeah, it's really low, the computer. I'm not a tall guy, but still this is pretty low to my standards as well. But you, have the, um, you have the clicker. In front of you. I, oh, I have a clicker. That, that makes it a lot more uh, <laughs> convenient. Uh, okay, let me see. So, okay. Would be nice. The clicker is not doing a lot. Okay, it's working. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things that has been mentioned yesterday as well, and it's really important also for a fund to, to do as one of their tasks is talent development, because we see that there, there are a lot of students coming from great schools like the I uh, in Kortrijk in, in Flanders, uh, but when they leave school, they know how to make a game, but they don't know how to set up a company. And also, they haven't made a game commercially yet, so there's still a lot to learn, and we think it's very important that also cultural funds play a role in, in that task that's very important to make them professionals instead of students. Um, we see that we're also most of the time the first investors because you have these people that are very inexperienced. They don't have any games out yet or they might have some games on Itch.io or something like that or they might have a Steam game but that's more of a student project that they elaborated on. It's very important uh, that they have a first investor. And a lot of investors are, of course, risk averse. You, don't, you won't see any big investors or investors that really want to make a profit uh, putting a lot of money in these young studios. So a cultural fund is usually the first one to acknowledge that talent and do some seed funding. Also, I think it's very important to get studios through their first few games. Um, making a game is one thing, getting it to the markets, also doing market analysis, all of those things that are quite complicated and that they don't really get uh, taught at school or maybe just a little bit, a uh, few hours on it, but it's not the whole thing. So it's really important to, for them to make some games and put them out there. And so they're starting to learn how to make games, how to get them into the hands of consumers, which is really difficult. And also one of the important things is that they can do this learning without it being game, game over. Because if you have a game that fails, it can be really bad for your company, of course. If you don't have anything coming in after a few years of work, you're in trouble. Um, so I think that's also a very important task for cultural funds to be there. Um, and that's part of the risk mitigation uh, that we're also doing for other companies, companies that have been, uh, have been around for a longer time, that they are able to get some funds from us just to, to lower the risk of making games. Because I think everybody in the room knows that it's high risk to, to invest in games. It's also high reward if you're successful. But of course, the successes are not for everyone. Uh, it's just a happy few that are able to have a big success and profit from it. 
Also, what we think that we do with our uh, cultural fund is that we provide leverage to studios. Because if you want to be seen uh, as a game on a platform, you need to work together with platform holders. And if you come in with money, the relationship changes immediately. Because otherwise, you're just one of the studios coming in with a great project, and the first thing you ask for is money. Um, if they come in with money, fr money from a cultural fund, they can say, hey, we would like to work together with you. We know we have a great game. We have some money. You have some money. Let's see what we can do together. And so the whole dynamic changes. Otherwise, it's like uh, you have these big giants like saying, hey, you have a game I'm interested in, uh, but I'm not going to pay you a lot, and I'm giving you a shitty contract. Um, so <laughs> they're not going to say that, of course, but it's usually the case. And we think one of the duties of a cultural fund is also to not only provide leverage, but to protect independence, creative freedom for all of those studios that are trying to innovate. So if you have money, you can create more independence, and that's where we come in, because we also we provide a conditional loan where people get money, and if they don't succeed, if they fail, they don't have to pay anything back, so that's really de-risking the whole thing. If they are profitable, we might get a small amount of money back, but that's not the point. We're actually there to give talent a chance to create a springboard to success and to create a springboard to other investors that mean well with the studios because there are also a lot of sharks out there like you have in every sector and we need to protect our talent. Uh, what we also do is we free up time for IP creation versus work for hire. Like the reality is that most studios have to do work for hire. They have to do things that most of the time they don't want to do. They, they just have to do it to get some money on the table, to get some food on the table. Um, so when they get money from the WAF or another cultural fund, it actually frees up time. They can say, okay, for the coming few days, we can really concentrate on creating our own IP. And it was mentioned yesterday how important IP is. So we need to free up more time in these studios for them to do their thing and not worry about uh, having food on the table. Because I'm, I'm not just telling that as an example. They really need to put food on the table and sometimes even that is difficult. So just to face reality. And also, once they have created IP, uh, the next step is to help them retain their IP. Because when you make something great, there's plenty of investors there. They will be knocking on your door like crazy. And at that point, um, it can be people from all over the world. So if Europe really wants to get serious about games, make sure you're there uh, as soon as you can to uh, invest in these companies and not leave it up to other countries, other continents to do so, because by that time you're too late. Johanna, I'm going to go to some recommendations. Uh, we just discussed to maybe do it up front so we get them done. Is that okay for you? Yes. Okay, and I think I'm speaking for a lot of cultural funds. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time. Uh, I heard a lot of great recommendations yesterday, but I would like to recommend to put in, to put in a few more. Uh, I was a big fan of what Diari said yesterday. Uh, it was spot on, all of the things that he was saying about the borders uh, and all, all of the rest that he said. So please also include this in the recommendations. Your recommendations are great, but put in Yaris. Um, some um, recommendations from my side is create more tailored game support. Um, you're including a lot of game support in other, um, other means, uh, other calls. But it's difficult because you have commission members that really love movies and series and they don't really identify with games. So they probably won't choose the games, and game developers know this. So they won't even bother to do an application. They will be like, yeah, what are my chances? I would rather do an application at WAF because they understand games or another cultural fund where they have a direct line. Um, so if you want to be attractive to, to gamers and game developers, please tailor it more. It's something that we all learned in cultural funds. We've been doing it for a long time. And I would like to offer our support um, from regional and federal funds. We've been doing this for a long time. We're eager to help Europe, uh, European Union. So just reach out. We have a lot of commission members, a lot of knowledge, a lot of learnings. Um, one other thing is to stimulate and reward, uh, reward European <coughs> co-production and collaboration. Like Yari said yesterday, that uh, co-production is already a reality. And of course it is, it's especially in the bigger projects. But what we don't have is the, the similar, similar thing to uh, movies, where you have two studios as equal partners uh, making something together and also displaying the names together at the beginning of the credits uh, on the video game. And that's something that Spielfabrik is working on a lot uh, with Cherry and, and Odile. 
And I think it's a great thing also because it kind of stimulates uh, collaboration. And I think Europe is all about collaboration and opening up those borders and being stronger together. Uh, what you can also do is identify promising teams and games and help them become great. We see a lot of potential and once we see potential, once we see high potentials, it's very important to embrace them immediately uh, because you can see this from the beginning. They come with a game that's really rough or maybe a prototype, but you can see the potential and you can see it can be great. But you have to give them the necessary coaching and have to give them the necessary uh, money. Then the last slides, also some recommendations. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, get games in front of platform holders and storefront owners. So we're creating a lot of great games. Like yesterday, I saw the trailer uh, for the Spanish games. And almost every game in there, I was like, whoa, that looks like an amazing game, but I have never heard of it. And that's too bad. It's so sad uh, that people are creating great games and nobody's seeing them. Yari talked about this as well. So we need to uh, work together with these platform holders and the storefront owners to be able to have more visibility for all of the countries. Uh, Europe is creating a lot of content for these platforms, so we have we are justified to have more plays and to have more visibility. Um, so that was what I, what I was talking about, about the visibility. Also stop the brain drain and turn it into a brain gain. Again, something that Yari uh, told us, they steal our talent, let's steal their talent. Um, it's something that's a reality. Uh, we are very attractive as a region, especially Spain and Italy with the great climate and the, the great, land, great landscapes and great food. So we are attractive to Americans, we are attractive to Chinese, to a lot of people. Uh, also, we are more or less a safe space uh, to, to have your children grow up in. Like in America, a lot of children are being shot in their schools. In, in Belgium, it's a lot less. So to a lot of Americans out there, and Belgians even working in, in uh, the States, they want to return because of the safety. Also, keep European IP European by quickly investing in it. That's what I mentioned earlier. And one last thing, be bold and ambitious, because we have a lot, a lot of catching up to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, so much. Kreshme, what is your take on Yuri's recommendations? Well, first of all, um, I would like to talk a bit about the future. Yesterday, somebody said that video games are today artistic because of the technological possibilities. I would disagree. I think that video games are artistic from 30, 40 years ago. I mean, if somebody played a game called Sir Fred on ZX Spectrum, which was made by a game developer from Spain, they, could, they were called Made in Spain, but this was an artistic video game. You were a knight that would solve puzzles and the game look, looked great for that time because there were no possibilities to make a video game similar to movies. Making a video game similar to movies doesn't make it artistic. In Croatia, we want to support more video games that have culture, artistic values. Why? I'm not against commercial video games, but they probably don't need our support. It's similar to the movie industry. A hundred years ago, Europe decided that it will finance the movie industry because they wanted to have independent movie industry that has art expression and that speaks about subject that probably no one else speaks about. And if we did that in the movie industry, I think we can do the same as Europe in a whole in the gaming industry. For that, we need financing. It's not enough what we have in the state budget. But if Croatia as a small country managed to get 4% contribution from big streaming platforms, why can't we do it in the gaming industry? We have big platforms for distributing video games that are all non-EU companies that are taking the profit from Europe. And it's okay, I'm not against the profit, once again. But give something back, a small percentage. Give something back to boost independent video games so we would have diversity. I don't care if nobody plays the games that are supported by 
stakeholders. I don't care if nobody watches the movies that are supported, but it's important to have them. It's, support, it's important for people to have the choice of playing that video games, of watching those movies. It's very similar to the movie industry. As I said, we have contributors in the movie industry of streaming platforms, VODs, operators, commercial televisions. And I think that we could put efforts, if we stand together as Europe, to take something back, to create an ecosystem, and, and it would be good also for the platforms that are distributing video games. They would also profit in the long run, because you would have bigger audience, you will have more video games, you will have diversity. Of course, at first they would say, okay, we don't want to give something back. But in the long run, this has shown to be good for everybody, like in the movie industry, and I think we can do the same. And I'm asking everybody for the support what Croatia is doing, what our audiovisual center with Chris Marcic is doing now in Europe. Help us and get something back from the platforms. That are, because in the movie industry, you have streaming platforms that are making profits, but why are they making profits? Because you have creative workers that are creating something. If they wouldn't create something, they wouldn't have anything to sell. And it's the same with the platforms that are distributing video games. If there would be no creative workers to create video games, what would they sell? So help us, boost the smaller studios, boost independent video games, give the opportunity for the future generations to have a choice. Thank you. Carlo. So now is my, my time. I, I agree with most of the recommendations that all, all of you have uh, explained. Um, I have to say that Spain is a, a very interesting ecosystem, as they said yesterday. We have, we have 18 or 19 million users of gamers in Spain. But it is also true that most gamers don't play Spanish video games or European video games. There is a very small share in that, uh, in that market of 2 billion euros in Spain that is destined to the, to the European productions. So we have to work on that in the case of uh, try to, to help uh, our European video, game, uh, video studios to have their chance to, to uh, transition smoothly from this uh, early stage of a startup that they stay with a micro or an SME, try to move alongside and, and to try to, to have the chance to be a real video game, to, to start from a prototype and to have their, their opportunity in the market just to see if we can increase this share of, of consumption of, of, of European video games. That's, that's, I think this is, is, that's a quite, quite a challenge no, that we have to work on. And um, for that, I would say that we have a set of, of, of instruments, but for instance, we lack one of the instruments that have been introduced then, and are uh, tax incentives, uh, uh, tax exemptions. It's something that we lack in Spain, and we have to work on that. Uh, I think I will, we will try to convince the Ministry of Finance on that. Uh, so we will see. And, but it, it is quite a useful tool. I say it because it's, 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 a, it's providing an indirectly a, a, an opportunity than to have the, the, the cost uh, lower. Uh, it is also true that in, in Europe we don't have a common audiovisual policy. We don't have a, a, a common policy on, on video games. And there is also a need to, if we all agree that video games are a cultural industry, if it's audiovisual industry, we have to, to level up with, with that, no? and we have to to change also in a European way. No, we, we, I, I find myself in trouble sometimes if I have to notify uh, state aids because there is the state aid regulation and video games are explicitly excluded from an article 53 or 54. They are, they are a cultural aid or, or a divisional aid. I, I, I think that maybe the European Commission have the same problem I have with the Ministry of Finance and we have to, to deal with digital uh, competition on that. No? Um, this is also true, and um, we know also at the European level, I recommend that we need also a, a, a common approach, and it means standardization, common data. I'm sure and that we all have in our, in our states and in our markets uh, very uh, associations and, and, and bodies that are very well informed. We have very useful data to work in at national level, but we have to build, build up something more in, a, in an European way, just, and for that we need more references, more studies, like the study that has been commissioned by the, uh, we, we see yesterday, uh, common approaches, and, and maybe also to have uh, more formal or informal working groups to, to have or to put all together 
European institution, the industry, and the member states. But when we work together, we all agree in most of the recommendations. We all agree. We see uh, best practices in, in other states. So I think that we have to be more coordinated and to be more all together uh, in, this, in this path to, more, to, to, to have a higher rate, a higher rate share of, of European gains consumption in this huge market than is, that is the European Union. So I will stay on that. No? So I have my own duties that I have to promote, and I will come to the, to the fiscal incentive. But we have also to, to, to look for this common approach. So, so that, that will be my recommendations. Thank you. Skinder, what do you see in a, in, in the need on a European level? Do you, every country is different, but it's still we have, have some common European. Well, um, after one basically a half day of conference uh, talking about exactly that. It's kind of hard to add anything new to the perspective. Um, so I would like to emphasize some, some things that I think that are important, even though they've already been mentioned. One of the parts is probably uh, common legislative rules for games, not just like mentioned yesterday. There's, there's lots of legislation that affect games, but they don't think about games. Um, just like the, the, the copyright uh, rules, there, there are no strict or, or copyright rules for games. Games are audiovisual and they are also technical and they are this and that. Um, so they are hybrid works, but what does that mean? Um, other problems or, or topics talked about yesterday like artificial intelligence, uh, data and stuff like that. Um, what I would really like to emphasize also is to um, work together within Europe with games. Um, it's, it's great to finally have a conference on the uh, Council level um, and it's great that uh, the European Parliament and the European Council are, no not the Council, the uh, Commission are starting to work and recognize games as well. Um, we need uh, to collaborate a lot more on the European level, I think. Um, it's, it's great to see other people, learn from other people, see what others are doing, what they are struggling, and, and also the solutions that they find. Um, problems that we have in Germany is, we, while we do have enough um, money for this, while we don't have enough money for the support, but we are ra rather having a large fund, so I don't know if more funds within the European level will help us. Um, but making the rules easier uh, would certainly help. Um, it's, it's one thing that you need uh, notification of the funding rules, but also if you want to support events and stuff like that. Uh, you, you always have to find a solution that works within Europe because it's, well, technically video games are supported, but uh, not if, it's a, if it has commercial aspects in it. And uh, if you look at it, Maybe if the event does itself does not have commercial aspects, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the results of it or what, what it's supposed to come out of it, uh, they usually are. And uh, I'm always told by the people in charge for the, for the uh, rules that I also have to check the second and third level. So it's, it's always hard to, to fund and support events that include video games uh, with state funding. Um, I'm interested if uh, the, the question of um, co-production in a, in a way of uh, having equal partners uh, is something, especially for the smaller, I mean for the large companies that's probably not a problem, they want to control the IP, um, they just need someone who contributes, uh, which also is great if you're, you're contributing because um, it, it helps you develop your skills for AAA games. But uh, it's probably a good chance for smaller uh, teams to work together to create something new if you're not large enough to tackle something on your own. Um, that'd be quite interesting if, if something could come out of it, but uh, I'm somewhat skeptical if it would work similar to movies because games on that scale are rather different. Thank you. Julianne. Well, um, 
everything has been said. So I will just try to, to say how much I, I support and, and just to, to summarize a, a bit that first we can learn a lot. It's what I take from the film and audiovisual industry in terms of funding, in terms of how they manage to build the co-production system with sharing of rights. So there is a lot of, we speak about antagonization, but actually there is a lot of synergies and things to learn from the different sectors. Maybe three points in terms of the main challenges that, that we see. Funding. Uh, public funding. We discussed yesterday and we discovered that there are actually not only the media program, which, is, which has a very small envelope for video games, 7 million in 2024, only for prototype development, and it's also for immersive work, so it's a, big, it's a small envelope for a lot of projects. So it's not enough, but we have constraints even though we need to have more money for the media because it's the core uh, program for supporting creation. But media is not the only one. Martin said yesterday, we have Media Invest. Will Media Invest really help uh, the video game sector? We need to monitor that so that it goes to, to that sector as well. We also have Horizon Europe, but it's still very unclear what its finances. We have the creative uh, uh, guarantee facility, um, and we have also the regional fund. So there is a, a variety of EU funding, let's say, schemes, but we lack clarity. What is there for video games? So something we, we, we are uh, advocating for is to build a bit of transparency around public funding in Europe. At national level, I try to give you some ideas at European level uh, and regional level as well. And I know that Spiel Fabrics, that was mentioned by Yuri, is working on a project called Indie Plaza to provide like uh, an overview of public funding, private funding as well. So funding is very important. To come back to what you said, we all want more money, more public funding, I guess, for video games. But it comes back to how you find the money. And the system of the contribution, we call them financial contribution or levies, are in place in the majority of EU countries for cinema and TVs. And we need to have the same kind of system for video games. Because if you take from uh, the market and you redistribute to the independent sector, of video games because the objective is to have independent companies and working for the diversity of creation. If you apply the same system, you can have more funding. So this is the, the way that Croatia is, is showing. This is also the reflection in other countries and I think it's extremely interesting. So the first point was the funding clarity and finding ways to ensure sustainability of funding for video games. The second point was what I mentioned, the uh, cultural, the strategic cultural assets and to preserve that at European level. Because we observed in several countries that the most successful video games companies are bought by Chinese, for example. And maybe there is something to reflect on on how to keep, we mentioned the IP, but also the companies in the end of European. If we want to think European perspectives, that would be very important. There has been some reflection around that uh, in 2022 with the French presidency, and I think it should apply to the video game sector. And the third point would be the regulation. Uh, we mentioned uh, the fact that maybe the state aid, the EU state aid framework, uh, GBER, so it's a bit acronym and technical, cinema communication, etc. It's not that easy when you want to support video games. In reality, it works because things are notified, things are approved, but maybe we can find an easy manner to make sure that they are green-lighted by the Commission and you can, own, or you can support development, production, but also promotion, because it's super important to support events and the promotion of video games. So the regulation in state aid, we heard also Yari mentioning the, the social and fiscal laws so that you can have mobility of workers, that it makes it, makes it easier for them to work in different countries. So a good legal framework is also very important so that we have a, a solid, independent and diverse uh, video game sector in Europe. Thank you. I'm, I, I, I'm thinking that it's, we talk a lot about funding and, and getting more money, but we also, games are competing on a global market. Uh, the players are on a global market, uh, the people who are creating the games are on a global market, and we see investments on a global market. Isn't there a risk that, uh, that a fund like 
like this will cement things on a, on a European level and the redu redistribution of the funds will be uh, not as equal as, as you wish because uh, on the movie side it's much more, the movies are created for a European market mostly, especially if they are in a, in a, in a smaller local language, but games are always on the global market. If, uh, if we are are going to be to compete as Europe on a global level? Uh, aren't there a risk of that? How do we get uh, how do we get uh, a European platform maker or the European champions that Frank is is talking about? Do you do you have any take on that? I think that, of course, we talked about it yesterday after the sessions. Why? doesn't Europe have a platform for distributing video games or why doesn't Europe have a streaming platforms for distributing movies? Why it's all non-EU companies? I think this is something also we have to address. Uh, but I think that maybe Europe doesn't need champions. I think we need content and this is something that we've done and we're proud of that we're doing it in the movie industry. In the long run, for the European movie industry, it's not crucial that we have one billion box office around the world. It's crucial to create cultural content that changes the world. And if we create this in Europe, this system of financing independent video games will also changing the world and will giving everybody a choice and I think that and this is something also that's important it doesn't mean that if you have an independent studio uh, making a video game that has cultural expression that this cannot be commercial this cannot also be commercial but what we're doing as a state we're putting down the risk on the company because they're not doing something for the market. Because if you're doing games like, I don't know, FIFA, NBA, Mortal Kombat, you know that is going to sell. If you're doing Fortnite, that is going to sell. And you're doing that because you want to sell your product. And it's okay, it's the market. But what we're doing here is helping companies not to fall down because the game backs fire on the market because it doesn't go with the audience and what they want to play. But it also can be commercial. It also can be successful. But nevertheless, it's culture and artistic. It can also be successful, like in the movie industry, and we have a lot of examples. So I'm not afraid about that. Color. No, I just wanted to mention an example. We don't produce movies in Europe just for the local markets. We produce for the world. And I wanted to mention Triangle of Sadness, a huge success, but it's with Swedish IP, if we can say, European support. And this is what we want. Like, we don't want a Netflix original that are maybe in Swedish, but actually it's a US, you know, work to perform. And we want this kind of approach for video games, European video games, to perform in the world. I would like to comment on, because I agree with a lot of things, but I think we're not powerful enough to go to Steam, to go to Epic, and to say we want return. <laughs> that with streaming platforms that are maybe more powerful, but what Europe gave us, they gave us the directive, the audiovisual media directive that said that countries can put up levies and can put up contribution. The uh, directive didn't say they're 4%, 5%, 20%, 18%. They say you can do that. Just give the countries a possibility and they will fight with the big platforms. But it's not a fight. In the long run, it can be beneficial for both sides. And I think that the Europe has the power to do that. I think so too, but it takes a lot of time. And we're just starting conversations among each other. And I also think we need to put in a lot more money before we can, like we're looking at others all the time. Let's first look at ourselves and put in more money. Um, because if we need to believe in our people first and first and foremost. And also if you want to create a platform, I see platforms all over Europe for, for streamers. 
and it's a good thing for the sector, but it's really hard for these streamers to survive because they don't have the content that everyone desires. Um, so we are still dependent on HBO and all of those big players to attract people to these streaming platforms as well. So we also need to be conscious of our limitations. Like Epic is trying to be a competitor for Steam. They have almost unlimited funds. Just let's be realistic about those things as well. Like we don't have unlimited funds. So let's first work together with all of these platforms and try to get visibility first, then try to get return. But we're all the way at the beginning. So I totally agree with you, but I just think it's a long process and it takes a lot of collaboration on a European level. So just let's take the chance to sit together more than once a year and, 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 and really work on this and create extra value. Also data value, which we are just starting to create. They also desire data. They have a lot of data. Um, so we have a lot to offer, but I just want to say stress that it's not an easy job to do. I, I totally agree with you. I don't know at what extent we have to compare with the movie sector. I don't know if video games is the same. For sure, there are different structures, or at least are at a different stage of development. As you told, I see that for movies, everything has been built up. We have big platforms, we have a lot of data, we have everything standardized, we have more or less IP also well, well worked, and in video games, there is a lot to do on this way, so we have to build those structures for it. For instance, at least if we want to compare with the movies, when we have everything, then we maybe can do that compar comparison. And um, it's true that, that uh, if you want European champions, we, we need the European instruments. And as you say, there are good instruments. Creative media is a good instrument, but maybe the budget is quite low. Spain has actually benefited from, from that media. I think that there are five Spanish companies in 22 Call. So it, it's a good instrument. So I, I hope it keeps going on and it has been a more, more budget on that. Uh, regarding Media Invest, we come back to the, to the, to the funds and the funds problem. Uh, it's a good idea because uh, equity is what the industry needs, but the problem is how to engage with that funds. Uh, if you set up your fund, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great idea. But if you come to Spain and you, you try to engage the private sector and the private equity funds, business angels to the, to the video game sector, they, they are quite reluctant to go there. So it's good to try to engage that, but it's very difficult. I don't know exactly how you can convince them to be on, the, on, the, on that path. That, that is a quite a challenge to, to go on that, but it is necessary for sure. There are also, I finish now, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we talked yesterday about co-production. That is something that is actually existing. It's maybe is not in an informal way, Maybe we have to improve the visibility of European uh, co-production just to, to build on that European uh, champions. Uh, we have a thing, and now I'm going back to the comparison with, with movies, sorry about that. But you have the Euroimage uh, program that is for co-production of movies in Europe. Maybe it's an idea just to try to, to, to invite the industry to, to build something with a European seal of, of approval and and to build on, on that visibility of the European video games. We have to do a lot of more marketing. I think that we are very good in uh, bureaucracy and very good in setting up uh, a lot of instruments, but we lack a lot of um, promotion and to marketing at the European level. So that's my point of view. I just wanted to add that with, when you're talking about private money and equity, um, I, I love like the cultural games. That's my true love for games, the small games. and. But when I talk to investors, they're mainly interested in scalability. So they're not really interested in those games, unfortunately, but that's where we can come in and where we should come in as Europe as well. Um, because those games will not get made otherwise or will have a very difficult time to get made. Uh, sometimes we can demonstrate that they have value by creating a vertical slice, just one level of a game and showing them, hey, this is great potential. It's an artistic game, but like, uh, just give an example, Greece, uh, from Nomada, it's a great game that's also commercially successful. So it's, 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 it's useful, it's doable, but not a lot of private investors will jump in if it's not a multiplayer game, if it's not a game as a service, because that's where you have the big profits. So we cannot rely too much on thinking that these private investors will jump in and, and save us in some way. We also can see a big difference between private investors who has industry experience and, and great industry knowledge and private investors outside of the industry, which has a, a total different 
type of, of factors they are looking into. We are going to wrap this panel up. Uh, is there, do we have time for an audience question? Is there an audience? Is there any questions from the audience? I see one here. Is it possible to? Yeah, thanks. Or. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rebecca Kaleva from the European Games Developer Federation. One of the things that uh, is often a bit overlooked when we talk about public funding for video games industry is how to empower uh, the people who are actually running the different funding instruments to secure, just as you mentioned in the beginning, that they are very well informed and aware on part of the video game industry and really understand it. One of the best examples is perhaps the Finnish uh, Business Finland funding instrument that sends the people running the funding instruments to each key European and global games industry event. Like those specialists sharing the funding are in GDC, in Gamescom, just to be aware of what is happening in global industry, but also to meet the Finnish companies there. But do you have any other good examples how to strengthen and empower the people who are sharing the funding for the video games studios so that they can able to help and guide them into the right direction? Maybe Germany? No? Well, I, I, I can pick the, the question. I, I think that trying to empower people, I, I love chatting and I love to, to try to explain people uh, the, the public funding that they have. But this is true, when we come to the industry sector, they are also not very, uh, I think that there is a gap. So uh, you have to uh, set up a very good communication system. This is why uh, there, there should be something between public institutions and the, and the bottom of the pyramid, the, the, the industry, facilitators, incubators, hubs, um, uh, places we have in Spain, in, Mal in Malaga, in Madrid, in other, here in Canary Island, um, uh, some kind of clusters that are speci specialized on the visual sector and, other, uh, and now also on, on video games. They are quite useful trying to engage people because they can put together academia because they're close to the universities, the industry, and try to, to mentor these uh, SMEs and these startups. They need something very close to them that will help them to go on and to try to apply to the funds, to try to do this uh, pitching, to, to uh, go with them, we, or, or try to, to, uh, to attract foreign investors and set up some pitching, something. No? But it is something that the public institutions, if we're talking about ministries or we're talking big institutions, public institutions, is quite, uh, not of cup of tea, or maybe no, it's not comfortable feel, or we, it's, it's, not, it's very difficult to, to, to reach that and do a lot of other things that we have to do. For instance, I'm cultural industries, I have video games, but I have all the cultural industries that I have to promote that to my hands. They need a very specific, uh, um, let's say, intermediaries, know, somehow. Okay. I think you have to hire the right people. Um, because like we, we do a lot of, like we, we are kind of like uh, the people they come to with questions and we make time for them and most of our time is spent on explaining things to people <laughs> or connecting people to other people. Like if they need a lawyer, we look for a lawyer. If they need uh, a developer that has worked with a, a, the same publisher, we connect them to the other developer. So I think it's really important they have people that really are passionate about games and are passionate about helping people achieve their dreams. Because we need to recognize that making games is a, is a passion and you need to protect these people a lot because they, they would do anything to get their game made and sometimes that becomes dangerous. So you need to hire the, the right people to really, not only the facilitators, they have a role. I think a cultural fund has a role. Everybody has a role in this and a an, and an responsibility in protecting these people and helping them become great. Small steps are also very useful. Now with the Spanish, Spanish Audiovisual Hub, it's just a platform, it's just a website where they have everything in a place. It has been quite useful and very well welcomed by the, by the audiovisual sector and, and video game sector. Uh, just to put something, everything in a one place will help a lot. Uh, apart from that, it should and we have to move on on other things. Yeah, and they, they don't like to read. Um, so they, <laughs> they really, <laughs> they come to you to say, hey, can you explain me what you're doing? And I can do it in five minutes and otherwise, like subsidies are driven by lingo, a lot of text, a lot of complex things. It's good that we understand it. That's the most important thing. 
and we have to help them understand it as well, and we have to speak to them as humans and not as yeah, lingo that we use and that we used to, but for them it's often it's I don't want don't want to say Chinese because that might be insensitive, but um yeah, we need to really lay it out like it was what you mentioned. It's not transparent. It's really difficult. Let's try to make it easier and just make a lot of time to explain it to them and take them by the hand and show them this is interesting for you at this point. Now you can go there. Now you can go there and, and just be there. So thank you for that. I can, I can also attest that from a country without an institutional support, I can also see that sometimes we have um, uh, companies are, are reaching out to uh, to other types of support at, at maybe a, a bit of a too early stage. But I think our time is out uh, and thank you for contributing to, to this discussion with all your experiences. I would just give you a chance, especially do you have any last words that you want to no, everything has been said. I think this this discussion will be be followed, and and we were in the breaks, and we will definitely not end <laughs> today with with this. And uh, I had a, like a list of questions that we never even got into. So, uh, next event, you know what we will, we will talk about. Uh, thank you very much.